This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. The Red Guards, the Cultural Revolution, 20th Century Nightmares, and yet Red Memory, the new book, The Afterlives of China's Cultural Revolution by Tanya Bronigan, takes us back to that People's Republic of China and then brings us forward again. We begin with an event, however, that is Tanya's reporting as a representative of the Guardian newspaper, and it is the Hu Jintao era. This is the first decade of the 21st century. And we visit the Pagoda Museum. What is significant about this is that there's a museum that appears to be remembering the Red Guards, remembering the Cultural Revolution. And yet, Tanya, congratulations and a very good evening to you. Your book is a delight only because all of this is new to me. At the same time, I remember what I was doing in 1966, 1970, 1979, with no knowledge of these terrible events. You go to a museum, uh, and the museum is the product of one man's genius, Peng Xi'an. What does the museum represent? What was it meant to represent as you visited? Good evening to you. Good evening, and thank you for having me on your show. The museum in Shantou is really the only place in China that records the history of the Cultural Revolution. And this, of course, was a decade that really tore China apart. We saw extraordinary violence, chaos, then a long period of stagnation in which China was really shut off from the outside world. Uh, two million people, we think, died, tens of millions hounded. And yet it's one that's largely been erased from official history, certainly. And the museum in Shantou was the attempt of an official called Peng Chien, as you say, really to try and grasp that history, to keep that memory alive, because he, like a, a small but very dedicated number of people in China, felt that it was essential to remember what had happened, to not allow those memories to be lost completely. And so... In fact, partly because he was somebody inside the system, he used his sheer determination, his connections from all the years that he'd worked as an official. He managed to persuade people to give him some money, some very wealthy businessmen. And eventually he managed to build this small museum, but he was only able to do it even then because he did it in a very out of the way place. It's a large but quite quiet port city down in the south of China. Uh, he did it much further away outside the city, a rather remote area, partly because it's the site of mass graves of victims of the Cultural Revolution. But also, really, it was its obscurity that allowed the museum to be founded, because even at the time it was very sensitive, and it's only become more so. Yeah, there are ironies here. First of all, he's an under dep he's a de deputy mayor of the city, and he is sponsored by a very wealthy man in Hong Kong, Li Ka-shing, who has connections to the party. But Hong Kong itself has now been transformed by the uh, brutality of of the administration under Xin, Xi Jinping. It's called Pagoda Park, and there was one phrase that uh, describes it. Using history as a mirror, never let the Cultural Revolution happen again. And yet, Tanya is there as a reporter for The Guardian, a respected international newspaper. And then there are men watching her climb the steps to the museum. They're wearing golfing clothes. Who are they, Tanya? They're undercover security people, undercover cops, which is pretty common in China. And I think particularly as the Cultural Revolution Museum became more sensitive over time. Initially, it had a little sort of trickle of visitors. Then, in fact, uh, because they had domestic coverage in the Chinese language media, you really did start to see a, a stream of people going there. And because of that, the authorities essentially said, well, don't report on it anymore. You know, we're not going to have signposts. So even when you arrive at the park, there's a little map of the park. There's no sign of the museum on that map. Really, it was an attempt to shut the subject down. They weren't going to destroy the museum entirely, but they certainly didn't want people visiting. And so 
around sensitive times, such as anniversaries of particularly grim events within the Cultural Revolution, uh, you would have a memorial taking place at the museum, but then you'd also have this sort of huge phalanx of uh, uh, undercover police who would uh, attend it. And so I think really because of that, when they saw there was a visitor and particularly a foreign visitor, they were very uh, alert uh, to the possibility that they really didn't want sort of outsiders being there. And certainly by the time I'd got all the way up the steps, because it's quite a large park, to the building at the top where the, the, the core of the museum is housed, then I discovered that it was closed off uh, for maintenance or safety reasons. What is inside this museum? What do we need to know? What is it that the undercover police working for authorities didn't want a reporter for The Guardian to see? We go to uh, perhaps an opening of the mystery, another museum, the National Museum, the Great Hall of the People, which you attended. And you note, uh, my note here says that there is mention of the Cultural Revolution, but it's in a dingy corridor or a dingy wall, and it doesn't have any explanations. Did I write that correctly? So, yes, you have this vast exhibition at the National Museum of China, which is its central key mark uh, exhibition. It's the one that Xi Jinping goes to, the, uh, pretty much his first public act after becoming the leader of China, is to take his colleagues in the Politburo Standing Committee down to see this grand exhibition. And it tells the story uh, of how the Communist Party essentially rescued China from aggression by foreign hands, the British, of course, but others as well, and propelled it into this age of prosperity and, and material wealth. But it only has a very, very small space for what it calls uh, setbacks on the road to socialism. And within that, there's a single picture, which is not even, in fact, of the Cultural Revolution itself, but of the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution, of people celebrating the fact it's over, essentially. And so if you attend the National Museum, this period of time is given no explanation to young people, to visitors from the outside. You must know a great deal to understand where it, where it fits into this story. And that's the story that's told in Red Memory. One more detail about these museums. It is many years later since you first visited. This was the time of Hu Jintao, not Xi Jinping. Are they still there? Are, is the dingy corner still there in the National Museum? Is, is the Pagoda Museum still existing? Do we know? To the best of my knowledge, the dingy corner is still there. Uh, I haven't been back to see for myself. Certainly, the authorities haven't reversed their verdict on the Cultural Revolution, which is that it was a catastrophe. But as time has gone on, and particularly under Xi Jinping, they've said less and less about those years. Uh, and so they really don't want people to talk about what happened or to dwell on it. It is in the school textbooks, but it's dealt with very much in passing. And as to the uh, museum in Shanto, unfortunately, uh, the last I heard, it had been very firmly closed off to the public. Many of the statues of prominent victims of the Cultural Revolution had been covered up. Uh, some of the big walls talking about events, these sort of grand etched stone walls talking about what happened, had big propaganda posters pasted over them. So it's a very different place now. And I think one of the things that's so striking about that to me is that certainly when I visited, there was absolutely no other visitor in sight because they'd kept it so uh, unreported on so marginal it certainly wasn't something that was kind of creating a, a popular alternative narrative it was something that almost nobody really knew about and yet even then that in itself has just been too sensitive even to tolerate that very mild very muted or very small and obscure form of alternative history we need to begin the story of what that museum talks about, but is not permitted to be seen by the Chinese people. Red Memory, The Afterlives of China's Cultural Revolution. Tanya Brannigan is the author. It is August 1966. We're at the Beijing Normal University's Attached Girls' School. This is a girls' school, young girls, for the elite of the party, the elite of Beijing. There is a vice principal, a teacher, Bien, she is murdered this day and over the next several days. We're introduced to her, not in person, but through the 
memory of her husband, Wang Jingyao. Tanya, uh, I, I follow this story as best I can. Wang has assembled a memory of those events and he was taking photographs at the time. All the and he keeps them all these years later. What is it that he hopes someday those photographs and those memories will achieve? Very much like Peng Chien, he really felt that the events of the Cultural Revolution, and particularly the victims of the Cultural Revolution, had to be remembered, had to be commemorated, had to be mourned. Because, of course, when his wife first died, even to mourn her would have been a, a dangerous act. And so although he created a sort of shrine to her in her, their home for him and the children uh, to remember her by, it was one that they had to hide for many years. So that very act of love, of loyalty, of mourning in itself was dangerous at that time. But he really believed, he took the risk of keeping, for example, the clothes that she had been wearing, of taking pictures of her murdered body to show the brutality that had been meted out to her by school pupils, her own pupils, uh, keeping the bloodstained clothes she'd been wearing, keeping the hideous caricatures and the angry, what were known as big character posters, posters denouncing her that had been put up around their home. He kept all of this secretly because he wanted people to know what had happened. And I think like many people, he felt not only that it was about doing his wife justice, about doing victims justice, but about remembering that time so that it didn't happen again. The events uh, that uh, are, uh, lead to this are simple enough to end the diary. In May of that year, Mao Zedong put out what is known as the notification, intending to in some way disrupt natural order. In August of that year, there is the invention of the Red Guards, the Cultural Revolution, a large events in Beijing. The attack on the teacher, however, comes somewhat before the large rally at Tiananmen Square. And it is striking because remembering this for Tanya in her reporting is a, a person who's compulsively keeping a diary of those moments. Uh, and yet uh, that diary itself is now an artifact that is, does it put our diary keeper at risk? Uh, this is Yu uh, Yao Jin. Uh, so Yu Xiang Jun for many years was writing, was blogging about her experiences as a Red Guard. That is something that she stopped doing several years ago, around the time, in fact, of the 60th anniversary of the Cultural Revolution sorry, around the time of the 50th anniversary of the Cultural Revolution. And that is not something uh, that she has returned to. So I think probably listeners can conclude for themselves, it does feel like a very different era now in terms of what can be discussed and debated. And of course, as when we spoke about the museum, memory, history has always been very tightly controlled within the People's Republic of China. That's become more so over the years uh, and even the limited space for popular memory for independent memory i suppose you might call it grassroots memory has now really been reined in to such an extent that there are very few alternative voices there uh the murder did, took place over several days it didn't happen all at once and teacher bian was aware of the violence and aware that no one was going to help her, no one was going to step in. It's it's quite extraordinary. These are teenagers, teenage female teenagers, who are beating to death slowly over days and torturing someone of great authority and great learning, the daughter of a banker. That becomes useful as a tool to justify these thoughts. But they're teenagers, so I'm not looking for uh, philosophy here. There was one particular teenager present at the time, born 1949, Song Bin Bin. And why she is important is all these years later, I believe she's still with us. Uh, she was the one in the photograph that frames the beginning of the Red Guard. She's on the stage with Mao Zedong. That day she was with him. Uh, do we understand why it was her? She was the daughter of an elite member of the party. Is that what picked her out to be there? 
Yes, she was very well connected and through her family connections, she was able to climb up to the rostrum and present Mao with this red guard armband. It's important to say that while Song Bin Bin was one of the uh, pupils of Bian Zhongyun and was one of the pupils who first denounced her or denounced the school's leadership for what was seen as being against the revolution, uh, being revisionist, counter-revolutionary, that she wasn't uh, one of the people implicated directly in the death of Bian Zhongyun. I understand that, but that is also introducing what is memory. And your book is explicit that this is a story that we cannot solve with memory. That memory, you write, is an act of creation. And I'm struck by the irony here that the remembering itself usually puts, as you report, the rememberer, the person going there in his or her mind, at the more center of affairs. But in this instance, those remembering, the then teenagers, now women in their 60s and 70s, as they remember, they become more and more marginal. It's almost as if they're fading from the scene. They're describing it as an historian. And you as the reporter are aware this is going on around you uh, and you're recording it. Uh, do they tell different stories at different times? Or is it always the same story, Tanya? I think what's really striking is that these are people who have chosen to talk about the events of that time. And this is one of the things that was very interesting about the sort of upsurge that we saw in people talking about their memories of the Cultural Revolution uh, around perhaps 2010 to 2014, that people were not only talking about the terrible things that had been done to them, as they might have done in the past, but we began to see more people talking reflectively about the responsibilities that right. they bore for what had happened. And so just to come out, uh, to apologize to Bian Zhongyun as these friends of Song Bin Bin and Song Bin Bin herself did, that was a, a bold step in many ways, but it was also a step that was very controversial because many people felt that in their reflection, perhaps they had not gone far enough, uh, that they didn't want to talk about right. the full extent of their responsibility. And that while they might not have been, while they were not the people who physically beat Bian Zhongyun that day, that the responsibility they bore in criticizing her in the first place, in making her a target, they still hadn't quite reckoned with. And so what was really intended as a moment of reflection and taking of responsibility, and perhaps a moment that might heal some of the wounds of the Cultural Revolution, in fact became deeply controversial with other people saying it was really a way to ex exculpate themselves. Let, let's go to the Red Guards themselves. Red Memories book, Tanya Brannigan, I'm John Batchelor. And we go to a moment, August of 1966, Red August it's called, and the memories of a 13-year-old many decades later in her 60s and 70s about how she got caught up in events that she could not understand and still is haunted, cursed by the memories of what she saw between August of 66 and her birthday, December 26th, 1966. Her name is Yu Cheng Zhang. Tanya, you was 13 years old, and she's remembering now these many decades later. Uh, she was part of the rally. I believe the date is 3 a.m., August 18th, we were called to Tiananmen Square. Why? What, was ha what happened that moment? So this was the first of the mass rallies that Chairman Mao held for teenagers, for Red Guards, really giving his seal of approval to the Red Guard movement, because of course the Cultural Revolution was not a grassroots uprising. Although the first Red Guard groups formed spontaneously, it was within a context uh, where it was becoming clear that Mao wanted upheaval. And Mao, of course, was a figure that they revered as a god, really. And so Mao had summoned them. He, he, his aim was to turn to the masses, particularly young people, to wipe out political opposition to him within the party. 
but he really called the, upon these young people and it was a great sort of grand ideological overhaul in which he said that the revolution had failed or fallen short in a sense, that the people within the party were either actively working with people to try and turn it back or had simply become too complacent and had been seduced by power and so forth. And so he called upon young people to remake the world. And through these rallies, he put his seal of approval upon the Red Guards, but also uh, through the words of the leaders there, they were encouraged to go out and destroy the, the four olds, as they put it, to smash the old world to get rid of the old culture and ways of doing things and to create this newer, ideologically purer uh, world. And this involved not only destroying uh, artworks or bourgeois property, but also turning on people themselves. Some of the most revered figures in China from the very top leaders uh, through thinkers and scholars and sports people who lost their lives as a result. A detail about what we understand Mao's idea here was to ignite the Cultural Revolution. That was the phrase that burned across China, soon introduced on the radio as well. And yet, Tanya gives us some details here that suggest that Mao was doing what other kings and emperors have done. He was purging those closest to him because he feared that his reversals and mistakes were going to lead to his loss of power. Nothing about communism here. It's everything about tyranny. 1958, the Great Leap Forward turned into mass starvation. Tanya reports perhaps as many as 45 million died. The party was extremely discouraged. And Mao saw that there were other voices in the party who challenged his decision making. And then there was... Uh, earlier in twenty in uh, 1963, about socialist revolution, that was a pre a precursor to the the cultural revolution. The four olds ideas, culture, customs, and habits are now part of the cultural revolution. Turning teenagers loose for free on buses, for free on trains, to roam across the land and persecute people for no cause. They don't even know them. They rob their homes. There's a scene that Yu Sheng Jen gives us. She's in a home and her classmates are beating the couple who live there. And she sees two girls pocketing Jade. What did, what did she make of that, Tanya? Well, she certainly concluded that in that case, those items, those treasures were probably not being taken to the revolutionary cause, but perhaps were being taken by those girls for their own private use. But of course, like so many Red Guards at the time, she was also very zealous herself in a sense. She had a very idealistic view. It's very hard for us to imagine, I think, how it must have been in that moment growing up in a country where you were constantly told that the People's Republic was under threat, which of course was true in a sense. Chiang Kai-shek certainly was still hoping to come and reclaim the mainland at some point. Uh, you had a, c a country that felt profoundly threatened at the same time had been brought up with this ideal of revolutionary struggle and sacrifice. Their parents, in many cases, had sacrificed immensely to bring about the communist revolution. They've been brought up to worship Mao. So there is this very intense atmosphere and these very young people, children, really, who are being told that they should go out and destroy, that they should force people to become better communists in a sense and so you herself while she was disturbed by some of the things she saw she also genuinely believed that the cultural revolution was a cause that was right and was just and her own hesitation in beating people for example she sometimes wondered if that was really her being perhaps too weak, not being pure enough, not really believing enough in the cause. It was a profoundly confusing and disorienting time for so many people. And as hard as it is for us to imagine what lay behind the horror, and of course, we know human nature being what it is, that people very often are capable of horrific acts that we might not have imagined. Uh, and people were driven by all sorts of reasons, be that 
personal hostility to some people, grudges or so forth, there also was a level of real belief that this was the right thing to do. The, her, her patrimony is apparently highly admired at this moment in time. I said that Chicha Bien, her father had been a banker, therefore she was suspect as a capitalist roader. It must sound better in Mandarin. In English, it sounds like a uh, like your HO train building, capitalist roader. Her grandfather would join the party very early days. Her mom and dad were both members of the party. Her great grandfather died, I believe, in the Great Leap Forward in the famine of 58 to 61 that continued into the 1960s. So the, there was reason to believe that she, her thoughts were reinforced by her whole family. And yet there's a scene that you give us through her eyes. It is the 31st of August. She and 12 of her classmates wearing red armbands and wearing their drab clothes, blue and gray, I think. They change out of the clothes that they had because these are children of the elite. They travel to Shanghai. And while her colleagues, her the other classmates are away distributing leaflets, she sees a man crawling on the ground. What did she see? What does she remember, Tanya? And so as she sees this man bleeding on the ground, she realizes as she looks that there is an entire baseball court full of corpses, a whole a whole number of people who have clearly been beaten to death by Red Guards. And what was most striking, perhaps, was that even speaking about that all those decades later, it was clearly something that was profoundly traumatic and very real for her, even in that moment. It really didn't feel like a memory in the sense of something one discusses, but something that was very immediate and visceral, visceral and still immensely disturbing to her all these years on. You present the scene this way as an amateur reader. You're in a Starbucks or a coffee shop in some fashion in Beijing. And she's very soft spoken, remembering her childhood. And yet at this moment, her voice becomes sharp, very loud, so that people can overhear. Is that is that the way you experienced it? Yes. Yeah. And was she aware of this? No, I don't think she was. As I, I said, it felt very much to me that she really wasn't with me at, at that moment, in a sense. It was as if she was back in 1966. She was back in that immensely distressing and traumatizing moment. And it seemed to me that that memory was something that remained very real and very present and very immediate to her. And yet there are ironies here. She also talks about riding the trains for free. So many Red Guards children were in the land with their red armbands smashing and stealing and plundering and accusing that the Chinese economy ground to a halt. The train system was halted. And yet her memory is there was, they were traveling for free back and forth across the country. This is an enormous country from Changjin, uh, uh, Chongqing, Chongqing. Uh, and there was one point where the train stopped and I, do, I didn't recognize why it was a attracted to them to get out, but they did. And she was very happy. Where were they? Do you recall the, the place in China? They were in a, a very famous Chinese beauty spot, um, a very well known scenic spot. And so they simply decided to leap off the train. And I mean, this is one of the very strange things, I think, for us to try to understand about the Cultural Revolution, that for many people, uh, for all the unquestionable horror, and for all the many people who are deeply traumatized by it, there were also a large number of people who remember the Cultural Revolution very fondly. And part of that is perhaps a nostalgia reflecting their concerns about the modern day, a feeling that the modern day is too materialistic or too empty of meaning and belief. Uh, and they see it as a sort of purer, more egalitarian time when everybody believed in something. But it is also about the fact that for many people, it was freeing. You weren't going to lessons anymore. You, you might be hanging around on a street corner with your friends and enjoying this sort of break from discipline, or you might be feeling that you were on a great mission to spread the world, the word of revolution, traveling around the country. And suddenly 
you went from being in this very tightly locked down society uh, as a child in a system where there was great hierarchy uh, to suddenly being on top of the world in a sense and being in a position of some authority and immense freedom. It's perhaps not surprising, even as strange as it seems to us, perhaps it's not surprising that it was quite intoxicating for some young people. And even book, people who had profound doubts, such as Yu Xiang Jun, nonetheless acknowledge that at the time there was also a certain excitement there. The book is Red Memory. Tanya Brannigan is the author. Tanya reporting for The Guardian many years in China had occasion to talk to people remembering the Cultural Revolution. We introduce Wang Shi Lin, a musician, a self-taught composer, and yet the child of peasants who had no advantages whatsoever that I can see. One day, of course, there was an opportunity nearby, a traveling circus is what I imagine, a traveling orchestra. And he was so inspired, he ran away and became member of the Red, of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. And yet the story is not straightforward. In fact, Tanya, his story is so unbelievable. Only, only fact could hold this up. In a novel, it would be uh, unacceptable. There's no verisimilitude. He remembers all of this period, as you say, liberating, but it also gave him opportunity, though there were moments where he was punished and brutalized. Is that how he remembers it both? It made me what I am, and then I remember the bad times at the same time. Yes, I mean, I think what's so striking about Wang Xilin's story is that in many ways, it's almost quite typical in that he was somebody who was very devoted to the party, a really zealous party member. He was very keen in political campaigns. He thought other people were not uh, true believers, perhaps. Uh, he spent a lot more time, despite his talents uh, in, in music, initially he spent a lot more time on political campaigning than he did upon uh, his, his studies. And yet the party turned upon him as it did so many of the people. I mean, bear in mind, both of Mao's heirs apparent uh, would die in the Cultural Revolution. Many of the most senior leaders were persecuted or, or died again. So in that sense, Wang Xilin was perhaps quite a typical case that all the years he had given to the party really counted for nothing once he was seen to have erred and once he was seen to be politically fallible. Uh, he really became the lowest of the low. And because that happened in a political campaign shortly before the Cultural Revolution, then he was really target number one when the Cultural Revolution started. He was already in trouble. They knew in their view that he was already a bad sort. And so the persecution really intensified. It became not only political denunciation, but a very brutal campaign. He was taken from town to town for what were known as uh, struggle sessions. This is where people would be up in front of a huge crowd and would be first denounced and criticized, but then also beaten and attacked by people who were watching. His suffering was such that he believed that he would die. And in fact, many of the people he was held with did die in that period, either killed, uh, executed, or in other cases, uh, people who killed themselves because they were really driven to suicide. And it was it's extraordinary that he survived. So the party in many ways gave him everything because it trained him up. It gave him his career. He still draws upon that, uh, the musical heritage as a, as a composer. And yet at the same time, it took everything away from him. His first work as a composer is not performed for 37 years. Mm -hmm. And while you're interviewing him, he goes in the other room and brings it back to show to you. But at some point right then, he, he grows extremely upset and unhappy. It reminded me of the scene with you. He raises his voice and he speaks harshly. What happened? He felt that perhaps I didn't really understand the subject. So I had asked whether it was um, the fact it was written by him that was the problem or whether it was also the style of music, because even the style of music could damn something. I was really trying to understand what in particular it was about this work that had been controversial. And he became extremely angry and said, you know, they were persecuting people, they were killing people. You know, what don't you understand? And I think 
obviously that reflects a sense that even though all the people I speak to in Red Memory are people who have chosen to remember the Cultural Revolution, to keep that memory alive in some way, remembering can nonetheless be a very difficult and painful experience. But also this sense that in many of the people I met that it's just so hard for anybody to understand if they didn't live through it. Uh, another of my interviewees said to me, you know, it's like reading a really difficult book and even young Chinese people can't do it. And the thinking be, you know, being, you know, how can you as a foreigner sort of hope to come in and understand this? So it's such an intense subject. Many people don't even discuss it with their families. Uh, many people have said to me that they've asked their grandparents about what happened and their grandparents just get angry. Of course, it was such a horrific time in many ways that for many people, it's just too fraught and too distressing to talk about. And, and when it does, it arouses strong emotions. His daughter is also a composer, but she lives in Germany, as yes. you lives in America, as Song Bin Bin herself moved to America. She's now back in Beijing. So going overseas is an escape for them, makes them feel safer. They, they have their memories when they're overseas. How does it work? We have about a minute. I, I, it's been a very mixed picture, I think. Clearly, some people find it easier to talk about what's happened when they've moved overseas. And certainly a psychotherapist uh, said to me that he's had people who've said to him, I could never talk about this at home, even sort of 30, 40 years after the events. But now I'm in another country. I feel I can address this. But for other people, I think uh, simply time distance has made them want to talk about what happened. So it was a very mixed picture, really. Um Wang travels with his daughter, and when Tanya asks him where he's been, he says, Auschwitz, they went to Poland and Austria. Uh, he says it loudly and ironically, Auschwitz. That is an experience the children of Auschwitz ha are, do have, and the grandchildren of Auschwitz of the Holocaust do have memories similar to the children and grandchildren of these victims of the Red Guard period, both Red Guards themselves and victims. So what I learned from Tanya's book is that it ain't over. It ain't ever over. As the way it goes, the past isn't even past. We're going to turn now to two princelings who were also victims of the Red Guard, now very prominent names in the People's Republic of China. The book is Red Memory. Tanya Bronigan is the author. Tanya's reporting for The Guardian over many years, over eight years, between the time of Hu Jintao and his premiership, his general secretaryship in the first decade of the 21st century, and Xi Jinping of the second decade and now the third decade. Both Xi Jinping and one rival that grew up at the same time as Xi Jinping, Bo Xi Lai, are victims of the Red Guard and were part of the Red Guard at the same time. Born between, I'm going to guess, 1946, the end of the Second War and the Japanese occupation, and 1956, the speech, the, the secret speech in Moscow by Khrushchev. The, the, that generation right in there, my generation, all victims of, all persecuted by, all part of the Red Guard, have opinions of them. And these two men are known as princelings. Tanya, again, your book is wonderful. What is a princeling in China? What does that mean when people talk about them? These are the children who were born to the very top communist leaders, um, particularly in the case of Bo Xilai and Xi Jinping, that they were born to figures who'd been involved in the revolution, had come to power as senior leaders, but as you say, who both fell foul of Mao very spectacularly, as so many people at the top of the party did. And so in both cases, their families suffered immensely in the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Bo Xi Lai's siblings, we believe his brothers were initially quite active Red Guards, we think. Um, but then his father was toppled. His mother, we believe, died after she was beaten by Red Guards. Uh, in Xi Jinping's case, um, his father had a, a daughter by a, a previous marriage. So Xi's elder sister is thought to have committed suicide because of the suffering that the family endured. His father was persecuted. Uh, a family friend says that at one stage, Xi's own mother was told to denounce Xi himself. Uh, and Xi Jinping was then sent, like 17 million young people, in fact, to the countryside. 
to extremely remote areas. I mean, there was nothing picturesque or sort of idyllic about this. They were sent to labour in pretty grim rural poverty. And so he spent about seven years labouring in the countryside in very grim conditions. The first is Bushy Lai's story. Bushy Lai was a princeling, as Tanya says, and he was a man in a hurry, ambitious, as is reported. He wanted to join the standing committee under Hu Jintao, was disappointed and sent to be the mayor, the boss of Chongqing. At this point, the story becomes difficult for me to follow, other than the fact that Bo Xilai was very handsome, very educated, exposed, but he was part of the Red Guard's memory. So he has in him both sentiment and anxiety about all these events that we're talking about. And uh, he was compared in his time in power to Silvio Berlusconi of Italy, Huey Long of Louisiana, who challenged FDR, and JFK himself, that kind of mix of personalities. However, he ran up against a party that was not going to reward him because, and therein lies a mystery, but always the intrigues never have one single explanation. His, his, his police chief in Chongqing ran away to denounce him in some fashion, and that brought not only Bo down, but the man named Zhou, I believe, or Zhao, the security chief on the standing committee. Was this a coup? Can you tell, Tanya? What seems to, the specifics of the case in terms of what brought him down directly uh, was the fact that his wife uh, was had reportedly murdered a British businessman who had been acting for the family um, sort of win their business dealings and had murdered him because she, I think she felt that it, he could potentially bring trouble upon them. And that, uh, whoa, well, unsurprisingly, under the circumstances, had then sort of conspired to cover this up. And so this was what finally brought him down. But it was clear that people at the centre were already looking at him, were very concerned about his rise. He had a very flashy style. The feeling was that he probably hoped to vault over Xi Jinping, who'd already been anointed as the next leader of China, uh, and put himself in the top spot. And so there was certainly a feeling, I think, that he was a very dangerous, unstable, unpredictable figure that really sort of couldn't be trusted. He didn't do things in the way that other leaders had. And so I certainly don't think there was a great deal of sorrow when he felt. Um, there were certainly rumours claims that uh, he may have plotted a coup. I think equally many people think perhaps he was he visited the military uh, at a key point in all this intrigue. And I think many people think perhaps the more likely scenario is that he just wanted to show that he had backing um, and therefore people shouldn't be too rash in removing him. But that certainly created lots of rumours about a coup or something of that kind. But, what is uh, important about the Red Guard detail is how he created a culture of sentimentality about the Cultural Revolution, singing Eastern Red, uh, Long Live Chairman Mao, uh, gatherings, colorful gatherings, operas played out for the people of Chongqing. And, but every, Chongqing, everybody in China knew about this. And what's striking to me is Xi Jinping picks this up and understands how how it works for the sentimentality of our history. As you say at one point, history is religion in China, a certain kind of history, if it's positive, it's progressive. Xi Jinping is the opposite of Bo Xi Lai. He's, he's subdued. He's uh, what you'd have to say plain. He's a wallflower. When he was in the United States on his travels back to China, I remember him stopping in the Midwest. It might've been Iowa or Kansas. A simple man he was presented to be, and he might have been, uh, but he adopts the Red Guard, Red East is Red sentimentality, and that's dominating today. Ma the Maoism part, the good Maoism, not the bad Maoism. Does he get that from Bo, or are they simultaneously calling back their similar memories? Well, I think it's certainly very striking that there was a generation who had been young at the time of the Cultural Revolution, uh, and we know that people have very strong memories of their youth, uh, for good or bad. Um, it was also very clear to them, there was actually really a kind of grassroots development of nostalgia about this period. So people began going to exhibitions, meeting up, 
uh, singing red songs together. And I think Bo, in a way, was kind of clever enough to spot that and tap into it. And similarly, I think she partly felt that people had lost belief and wanted to return to a more ideological age. Um, but yes, I mean, there are unquestionably, I think, echoes of that time, the appeal to this much more red ideological culture. And I think perhaps structurally as well, we have to remember that China had been through this period of immense double digit growth, just staggering seeing the leaps ahead that its economy was taking. What we saw in the period that I was there was that that growth was slowing down, that people were becoming much more aware of its costs in terms of inequality and environmental devastation and so forth. And so people were really, I think, looking for some kind of meaning, uh, the kind of meaning that perhaps is created or uh, fostered with this return to the past, with a return to sort of a, a pure belief in the revolution, in communism. And so certainly under Xi Jinping, um, although it's very much focused around him rather than around Maoism, we have business leaders studying Xi Jinping thought. Uh, it's become much more central. Political belief has become much more central to the country's life again. The sentimentality. When we come back, there are impersonators of the major characters during the Cultural Revolution. There are also teams of people, clubs that come together to remember those days. The book is Red Memory, The Afterlives of China's Cultural Revolution. Tanya Brannigan is the author. Remembering all these decades later is a fresh way of participating in history when you were too young or weren't even alive to remember these events. They can sometimes feel like the English Revolution of the 17th century. And we still speak of events that happened in 1605, the gunpowder plot and of Oliver Cromwell, the Puritans riding across the land. America comes out of that period. So when we recreate our history, that's what we're doing. We're living through it as if it informs us today. It's sentimental, but at the same time, it can be stirring. In this instance, however, people who were too young to understand what was happening around them as grown-ups have clubs or groups or friendship uh, across the internet. And sometimes they meet in person. And entertaining this group or entertaining everybody in, in Beijing and Shanghai, wherever he travels, is an impersonator of the most famous villain of the gang of, well, the man who was chief rival to Mao Zedong. This flabbergasted me, Tanya. The man who looks like, his name was Liu? Is that, that was the man who's- uh, Lin Biao. Um, Lin Biao, yes, was, Lin Biao. Yes, I mean, Lin Biao, I was, I have to say, I was fairly flabbergasted to discover a Lin Biao impersonator as well. I mean, there are, there are plenty of Mao impersonators, other key figures like Joe and Lai and so forth. Um, Lin Biao was much more surprising precisely because he's been vilified for so long um, as the sort of the greatest enemy of the people, really. Um, even though he died before the end of the Cultural Revolution, he was actually given a posthumous show trial um, for his responsibilities for the era. And he had this extraordinary trajectory in which he went from being something of a military hero through to being really uh, Mao's chief sycophant, essentially, the, the person who was doing the most or one of the most to foment the Cultural Revolution, to create this personality cult. It was him who kind of developed the first Little Red Books uh, when he was leading the army. And so he was defense minister, but more than anything, he's really remembered for telling people to follow Mao, uh, lauding Mao, praising him to the skies. Whether he believed all this or it was simply tactical is a, a very good question. But in any case, uh, even sycophancy really wasn't safe in that era. It was a time that was so unstable and turbulent that only Mao himself uh, could feel secure at that time. And so Lin Biao, who had been so central uh, to Mao's mission in the Cultural Revolution, quite quickly uh, begins and is, is positioned as his successor and his heir apparent um, 
in a way, although Mao chooses to do that, it also really seals his fate because quite quickly he falls into Mao's disfavor. Um, one strange thing is that because the only way to advance in that time is to praise Mao to the skies, uh, the very fact of praising Mao then becomes suspect to Mao. So really, whatever you do, you're doomed. And so he falls from favor. Um, it becomes clear that Mao's turning upon him. And he and his wife and his son then try to flee China in a plane in very mysterious circumstances. And the plane crashes again in rather mysterious circumstances in Mongolia. Not entirely clear what happened, still remains a mystery. Um, but as I said, he was vilified after his death when people were finally told about it, which was not for many months. Uh, they were told that Chairman Mao had been sort of nurturing really this viper. And it was a critical moment for the Cultural Revolution because I think people really thought, well, either Chairman Mao has made this sort of terrible mistake, in which case he can't be the great godlike figure that we trusted him to be, um, or he's just vengeful uh, towards people around him. And he's this sort of emperor dispatching people who've fallen from favor. And also, of course, because Lin Biao had been at the sort of forefront of praising and lauding Mao and the Cultural Revolution. And then suddenly they're told, well, he didn't believe, believe in any of that. So if the person who'd been its chief champion didn't believe in it, then really, why should they? And so this came about halfway through the Cultural Revolution. And it was the point at which really even people who had kept a degree of idealism or belief began to think again. The clubs that come together to remember the Cultural Revolution are the grown-up men and women who were called educated youth when they were forced, mandated, dispatched, deployed, banished to the countryside. Uh, you speak to several of the women who are now in their 60s and 70s, and the way out of the the crude conditions where they lived always bru brutalized. Um, the, the, they had no protection. They were not with their parents. But what is striking about it is that many years later, they enjoy talking about it. They enjoy where I got the feeling this was like 1966 uh, bandstand. You know, they, they dance with each other. They remember rock and roll. Is that what it's like to be with them? I mean, I do think probably part of it simply comes back to the fact that if you were young at a certain time, we have what's called the sort of the memory bump, which tends to happen between about 15 and 25, I think, roughly. And for them, those very formative years were spent in the countryside. So as bitter as, as they were and horrifying in some cases, they still perhaps have a certain there's certainly a very strong memory about them. And also simply they were young. They were with friends. They did the best. It's a it's a very bittersweet memory i would say for many of them um they talk about how difficult it was how harsh it was there's also this sense of pride in having come through it i think perhaps one of the ways in which they've found meaning in their experiences is by saying of course it was awful but it wasn't meaningless because it made me into this stronger person or this person who sort of fundamentally understands life better than all these sort of coddled young people. And, and so, as I say in the book, it, it is a little bit perhaps like talking to men of a certain age who are veterans from a war. And as horrific as their experiences may be, sometimes there's almost this touch of sort of patronizing younger people. Well, you haven't been through it. You don't know. We're wiser in a sense than you are. It was impossible not to like them. They were very warm towards you telling stories. There didn't seem to be any psychological pain in recovering, even the stories about how they got out of the village, how they married, how they ran away, how they were isolated. It was it was convincing that human beings adapt to with the best circumstances they can, and good for them. We're going to turn now to a story later in the Cultural Revolution, 1970, that is horrible to consider, but it's part of the legacy. The book is Red Memory. Tanya Bronigan is the author, The Afterlives of China's Cultural Revolution. Tanya was eight years in the People's Republic of China between the first decade and the second decade of the 21st century. And the stories of the teenagers ranging across the country or of the men, young men born into peasant families in the countryside 
who find the People's Liberation Army a ladder up until they run into the Cultural Revolution and are brutalized. We now turn to a story of a man who's made himself, remade himself into a lawyer after many years of struggle, but his memory is horror. It's 1970. His name is Zhang. Zhang and his father live with their mother, who's an educated and sophisticated woman who has severe doubts about Mao and what's going on. Tanya introduces to the woman at the center, Yu Shang, uh, her name is, it's Fang Chang Mo. Yeah, Fang Chang Mo. Who is she at the time? What is she representing about the Cultural Revolution? Why, why is she speaking truth? She was another very committed member of the party, like, as I've said, so many victims of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, she'd met her husband when they were both uh, training as medical staff uh, working for the party. And she'd been, in that sense, a great believer. But she and her family had also been through immense suffering. So at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, her mother was forced to leave the family home, essentially was forced to go back to her hometown. Um, her daughter, Zhang Hongbing's eldest sister, became a very passionate Red Guard, was one of the many who travelled to Beijing for the rallies. But tragically, that great uh, movement of the young people across the country contributed to a huge outbreak of meningitis. And Zhang Hongbing's sister was one of those who died shortly after returning. So she'd lost her mother, in a sense. She'd very clearly lost her daughter. Uh, her husband then came under suspicion and was criticised and persecuted and beaten very pretty brutally. Uh, but then her, she herself, uh, despite her years of service, came under criticism as well. And so she too was being held, was being denounced. And eventually, uh, by the time Zhang was about 17, she was finally allowed to return to the family. But her idealism, her belief had really gone. Whether because she was so psychologically damaged by what had happened, whether she'd simply reached the point of no return, I suppose, she began to denounce Chairman Mao while they were at home and to say that everything that had got, gone wrong uh, had been his fault, that the disgraced leaders had done nothing wrong, essentially, that it had all been Mao's doing. In other and words, John, she told the story as we would tell it today, that yes. the, the fault is in us, not in our stars. However, you arrive at this revelation by by traveling to, I picture, a, a rural town or some town outside the big cities. I'm not sure. All, all cities in China can be big. Zhang takes you there, and he takes you to what, amazingly, is a grave site. Where, where are you? It's in the middle of a building site, essentially. And at first, when he takes me sort of into this backyard, I think that we're just passing through on the way to his mother's grave. And then I realize that around the stone, there's a brick wall going up. You can hear a bandsaw going in the background. There's just this sense that the grave is under immediate threat. And that's really what prompts him to tell his tale. That's when he has begun to speak about what happened and to try and keep his mother's grave secure. All right, but we're wandering into Shakespeare territory right now because there is something of a haunting here, Jean. He wants his mother to know that he regrets, he's apologizing. Uh, he calls himself an unfilial son. The events around her murder are striking. Uh, she begins one night making declarations, and they challenge her father and son, write this down or don't write this down. She goes and writes it down. She said, I can be very quick about this. It's a scene that only history could give us. It's so fantastic. And they either call on the authorities or inform on her, but before that, they attack her. He, ta he attacks her, Zhang attacks her with a wash, wash, Dish. He, 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 he attacks her, he hits her, but also, as you say, even more critically, actually, they go and inform the authorities of what she's done. And that really is writing her death sentence, um, as they knew at the time. 
it is very hard, I think, for any of us to imagine what must have gone through his head at the time. He'd been through a profoundly traumatic few years, losing his sister, obviously, seeing his parents sort of disappear into this system of denunciations, losing his mother, her being away from home. And so you have a 17-year-old who must be so dislocated and at the time is also being told that Chairman Mao is a god, as as he says, you know, the song they were taught at the time, not only is he a revered figure, but he's the one that you have to love. He sings to me, mother and father are dear, but Chairman Mao is dearer. And his explanation is simply that to him, anybody denouncing Chairman Mao really couldn't be his mother anymore. She wasn't his mother at that point. She was this terrible counter-revolutionary villain that had to be reported. But of course, he has had to live with that since the age of 17. Uh, Fang was eventually rehabilitated. Her name was rehabilitated after her death and after the end of the Cultural Revolution, like many of others and many others who died. But he has had to live ever since, not only with her loss, but with the knowledge that he and his father were the ones who sent her to her death. He was executed publicly. Did they attend the execution? Because there's a scene where she's looking for them in the crowd. Were they there? No. And they in were... fact, that was, to me was one of the most haunting things that an acquaintance said to them. Yes, her, she was looking around. She was looking for you. Uh, and they buried her in a mass grave that was later moved. I lost track of how many times she's been buried. Yes. No, she was she was buried in a grave. And then it was at first she sort of wasn't wanted in a sense because she was this counter-revolutionary she was disgraced then the authorities decided to build a bridge i believe and so they moved her body and so this time she was i suppose simply an inconvenience by that stage but there was something so terrible about the life of this woman whose belief and whose love and investment in her family had all really turned to ashes and then even in death couldn't be allowed to rest in peace it seemed and zhang tries to talk to her she he he says again it's shakespeare she never she never answers me mm. he feels like he another one of those scenes we had one with you we had one with the composer is he out of is he out of body when he talks like that to you she never talks to me. She, he's trying to communicate with her. I don't know. He's uh, he's in some ways a very controlled person, I would say. Um, but clearly at the same time, a man who, as I said, has lived with immense amounts, not only of grief, but also of guilt and distress. He says, I brought the guardian to see you. He, he Does he think she's there listening? I don't know, to be honest. It's a, uh, he, I think the overwhelming impression I really came away with um, is of a man who is trying to live with something that really most of us simply couldn't live, live with. Um, and I, one of the things that uh, a psych psychotherapist I spoke to for the book said to me, you know, increasingly I've come to admire people just for surviving. Um, and perhaps that's what I think of when I think of Zhang Hongbing. A detail about the town. About is, this, is this with the hotel, the Buckingham Hotel? That was the Buckingham in, Palace Hotel, yes. Yeah, which you said was the dirtiest and most disorganized hotel you'd ever been in. What is What is happened to that area we we've gone past china's rebuilt itself and you're the, it's only emphasizing the towers have little towns like that been bypassed have they been leveled is that why they keep moving his mother's grave well no i mean that they're, they're in this extraordinary phase of development particularly um at that stage everywhere you went in china there were cranes on the horizon as you know everything was being dug up everything was being overhauled um, I talk in the book about, you know, going away and discovering that all the noodle shops that used to be sort of opposite us have just kind of disappeared under the bulldozer, but then equally a sort of a park springing up in their place in a matter of days. So it was a time of extraordinary 
transition and transformation. And in a way, I think that's also partly why it's obvious, often seemed quixotic or even perverse to talk about the past in China, because it was just so hard to keep up with the present. And yet it kept reinserting itself into people's lives. There are obviously some things that can't be left behind. The book is Red Memory. Tanya Bronigan is the author, The Afterlives of China's Cultural Revolution. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Basher with Tanya Bronigan who was eight years reporting for The Guardian in China. And that in that time, she pursued and captured thoughts about the Red Guard of 1966 to 76. There's an irony here. Many of whom participants are now senior and are not necessarily going to be with us long. So this is the memory of that period. But Tanya also spends time with psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists at a meeting in Shanghai. And I'm struck by how they uh, regard this as, uh, I wrote down from Dr. Yang, he calls it Maoist hysteria. What does he mean, Tanya? I think that may have been my phrase rather than his, but it was a, a time of, it was a convulsion. I mean, there was something about the Cultural Revolution itself that was a sort of collective hysteria or collective delusion, you might say. As I said, there were very, um, there were motives that we would definitely recognize that will come into any kind of big uh, campaign or movement, I suppose. People always have their personal interests, grudges, ambition, all of those things. But there was also a level of real belief, um, of fear for the revolution, of zealotry uh, that really did transfix and grip the country. People really believed. Yes, uh, euphoria and mania. Now we come to Dr. Chen, who talks about uh, f something called eating bitterness. What does that mean? It's a very common idiom in China. You come across it a lot. And it, it really means sort of suffering and getting on with suffering, just getting on with it. So you, it's something you'll see in job adverts, for example, that people will talk about um sort of saying, you know, we want a worker who can eat bitterness. It means we want somebody who's not going to moan and is kind of going to buckle down. But it's also something that people will quite often talk about with a, a certain kind of pride. Um, but it's also, of course, quite fatalistic because it's the sort of the power of the powerless, in a sense. It's what you do when you can't do anything else. These psychiatrists, now you make a make a very good report that psychology or psychiatry is not a large faction in China. I think at one point you report there are 20,000 psychiatrists or psychologists. I wasn't psychiatrists, sure. Psychiatrists, I believe. Psychiatrists in a country of more than 1 billion people. Is psychiatry disregarded? Is it is it disdained by the party? It's medicalized. Um, it's, it's quite limited, I would say. Certainly psychology in Mao's time was shunned as a sort of bourgeois pseudoscience. Um, it wasn't really tolerated. Um, I suppose mental health care is in a sense being seen as something of a luxury, simply put. Um, and so historically, there hasn't been a, a great deal of investment or interest in it. And it's only relatively recently, particularly within the sort of the last 10 years or so, that psychotherapy, for example, um, has come to be recognized and sort of incorporated into mainstream healthcare, I would say. There's an irony here of when was the Cultural Revolution? You meet a novelist, I believe, in a shop in Beijing or Shanghai. And you are talking about how long did the Cultural Revolution last? And she makes an ironic remark. It ended last April when my father died. What was she conveying? Yeah, well, I thought I'd simply misunderstood her at first because I was so taken aback by that remark. But in fact, I'm not sure it was even ironic as much as heartfelt, which was simply that her father had never recovered from the breakdown he experienced in the in 1966 at the height of the Cultural Revolution, when he had been persecuted by Red Guards. And so she said that right up to his death, uh, the year before we spoke, he was still having delusions, I suppose, where he was, or psychotic episodes where he was arguing with the red guards of the time as he saw it it was as if they were still there he was he was still living with this 
in a very real sense for him. The story is not complete because the generation, the children and the grandchildren have to play out their memories of what they learned from their grandparents. But again, it's critical to understand that Xi Jinping is influenced by all these contradictions. He is now called Xi Da Da. That means Uncle Xi. Is that what that means? Xi Da Da? Well, yes. This was very popular at the time I was there, sort of Uncle Xi. So a very intimate phrase again, I suppose, in a sense, which again takes us back to that sort of idea of Mao as being sort of close to you and always present and sort of understanding uh, the people being rather avuncular, even as he was also this sort of godlike figure. It, increasingly, we're seeing Xi Jinping talked about as Chairman Xi, uh, for example. So there's a there's a real feeling of him having clearly not the sort of deified status that Mao had, but certainly a kind of glorification of him, which hasn't occurred with previous leaders certainly since Deng Xiaoping, but even really since Mao. In these last years, since you compiled this very careful chronicle, in these last years, China has turned into a completely different state than I remember in the first decade. Surveillance and what you'd have to say is, a, well, your experience climbing the steps of that museum, being followed by men in golfing clothes, is now commonplace, but more to that, it's done electronically and digitally. And there's a sense of a, the surveillance state and repression or suppression or banning of certain topics. Is the cultural revolution banned in modern China to your understanding? I know you're not there now, but is it talked about the way today in 2023 that it was possible to talk about it in from 2008 to 2015? No, it's steadily become a more sensitive subject, but it's not banned. I mean, it's important to say that. As I said, the party verdict was and is that it was a catastrophe, that Mao was misled into it by the Gang of Four. So it's not something um, that is utterly taboo in the way that, say, the events of 1989 with the very bloody, brutal crackdown on the pro-democracy protests would be. But it is a very sensitive topic that people, that the state would rather people did not discuss where possible or only discussed very briefly or obliquely or euphemistically. And I mean, I think the other sort of aspect of that, of course, that became very clear to me, and this is where the psychotherapists come in, is that perhaps when I started working on this area, I really thought it was the, the state repression that had created this silence. But I realized increasingly that a lot of it was about personal trauma as well. And it's those two forces together that have really conspired in this national amnesia around the Cultural Revolution. So while some people will look back at it, particularly the ones who sort of view it rather nostalgically, um, a lot of people just don't address it at all. Yes, you, you note that when you hear stories, they're true and false, and they're somewhere in between true and false. There's a uh, turning that leaves things out that would be helpful. Is, is that your memory of compiling these things? You're never quite sure what they're leaving out. Yes, and I think everything that we know about memory generally is that memory is very fallible. It's a creative process in a sense. So when we remember something, we're not actually pulling out a whole scene that exists within our memory, we're essentially reassembling that memory from component pieces. Um, and so memory is not consistent, it's very fallible. That's particularly the case where people have been traumatized because trauma really fractures memory. And then memory is also something that we use quite actively. We're trying to understand ourselves. It's about identity and about making meaning. And so for all those reasons, even when people are doing their sort of heartfelt best to give an honest account of events, it will be partial and it will be fragile and it will be fallible. Red Memory is the book, The Afterlives of China's Cultural Revolution. Tanya Bronigan is the author. I'm John Batchelor.